Welcome to another edition of Behind the Music. This time, it's a great pleasure to welcome Mariana Parner Simpson, one of the founding members of the Houston Chamber Choir, a member of the alto section, and somebody that shares the same last name as the founding conductor and artistic director, Robert Simpson. Mariana, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I have to ask, you have the same last name as Bob Simpson, the artistic director. Is there any relationship there? <laughs> yes, I've been married to this guy for um, 26 years now. 26 years. Yeah. How did you meet? Well, I'm, um, you can tell that my accent is not from Texas. <laughs> Neither mine, from mine neither. <laughs> uh, in 1990, my family immigrated from Soviet Union um, to the United States, and I landed in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, that was a very critical moment in my life mm -hmm. because um, I was at the beginning, I was desperate in the new place with the people who spoke English and I did it. And um, I was with my daughter who was 13 at the time. And uh, I needed to adjust as soon as possible to find a job, but all of, all of that is, was very hard without English. So to help me with my um, desperation, my friends found out that Atlanta has lots of choirs. Uh -huh. They uh, told me, why don't you go and audition for some? You don't speak English much, but you could sing in English. And I said, oh, yes. So <laughs> they um, arranged the appointment with me at St. Philip's Cathedral. It's an Episcopal Cathedral downtown um, in Atlanta. And uh, there I met Robert Simpson. I sang for him. He welcomed me in the choir. And I noticed right away, not only his height, <laughs> he was the tallest man I ever met in my life. And um, also the fact that he was being very nice to me and seemingly understood what I was trying to say in English that won my heart right away. And then after he accepted me to the choir, I was so happy. And it turned out that I have no way to get there because Atlanta, just like Houston, there are, you don't get to all the places by public transportation. I didn't, right. I just didn't have a car. I didn't know how to drive. Right. So he um, asked me where I, where where I lived, and I told him, and he said, "Oh, that's okay. It's not it's not far from where I lived. I'll pick you up. This choir director is gonna pick me up." And every Thursday, believe it or not, he would um, run down to the step of my to the do, uh, gate to, of my apartment, and I came out, and this wandering every time how this six feet eight inches guy could fit into the tiny Mazda Miata. <laughs> it felt like he was just folded in a half together, but he felt very comfortable. He loved sports cars, he still does. And every Thursday and I was uh, riding with him it greatly improved my English, I must say. <laughs> and we talked. And he would take me back home and we talked. And that uh, was the beginning of our friendship. Mm -hmm. And that one, of the, one day I heard something from him that I didn't know what to think about. He said, you make me happy. And my heart was just fluttering. And then I came home and asked my friend who 
already lived in this country for, for a year and she spoke very good English, said, is that like Americanism? It's just being nice or it's more to that? <laughs> and she said, could be both. So I um, waited a little bit more and then more came. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that's how we met. And, but I must say that I was smitten right away with his musicianship, his mm -hmm. ability to conduct. And when I first was present at the rehearsal, uh, being from, graduated from St. Petersburg, Petersburg uh, State Conservatory, which is a very good school, I felt incredible connection through the music to, to all I loved. And I thought, Americans are so different. The country is so different. I have so much to adjust, but I don't have to adjust to music. I'll already, I, I'm already in it. And, and this is my bridge and my ground to this, to live in this country because I could survive. That was my first hope that I will survive. You mentioned the St. Petersburg Conservatory and you graduated from there. You have a master's in, uh, in uh, choral conducting and you actually had your own choir yes. in St. Petersburg. Yes. Tell us about that choir. Camaton is the name, what's Camaton, the name of the choir? Camaton means tuning fork. Uh, we had a song mm. and we just decided to name our choir this way. Uh, that was, uh, I, I've created a, a community choir and I've been an artistic director for 10 years. Boys and girls who came after school, uh, you know, in Soviet Union, everything, all the arts and, and other activities happened after school. In school was only school. We didn't have this um, wonderful programs in school. Everything was outside. And so it was, a, they called it palace of pioneers. It wasn't a palace, it was very, 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 far from palace, it was just a, a building where kids all ages would come and learn how to play chess, how to build airplanes. Uh, there were clubs and one of the clubs was um, choral, choral, choral community choir that I started and built it and it was a wonderful group. It was boys and girls first and then um, somehow boys disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a choir, yeah, which I um, felt then and I feel now needed a special care, an additional boost of confidence. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a wonderful organization. And when I go back to Russia, believe it or not, all my girls that now pushing 50, they are coming back. And every time I come to see them, they all gathering together, they stand in three rows and sing the songs that we sang back then, 30, wow. years, 30 years ago. Wow. And it's so touching. And they, they still cherish the memory and we still connect, we're connected. We have a, uh, Facebook, the emailing each other, calling each other, sending pictures, and they're following me up very, very closely, know everything about my life. That's, that's very dear. They're like children to me, and they incredible, incredible um, gift that we have. So when you came to Atlanta and you joined the Episcopal Choir, at the cathedral, you were already very well versed in the, the whole choral tradition and the, the ethos of a choir. 
How did that translate into the Houston Chamber Choir? How did that come about? Oh, Houston Chamber Choir came uh, about in 1994 uh, when we moved to Houston. Um, Bob was hired by Christ Church Cathedral, and I and we were we married in in May of '94. So I moved in with my husband. And the first year we um, tried to get settled, tried to make sense of Houston, downtown, it was not easy. And Bob felt, he felt it for a while that he needs another outlet mm -hmm. for, his, for his creativity beside the, the church. He was very happy with the church music. He grew up, you know, became a musician, uh, being a church mus musician. But he, his, his talent grew and he, he, he needed more room for that. Right. More right. application. We didn't know many people in Houston. We knew everybody who goes to the church and he had a wonderful choir and wonderful support from the dean of the cathedral and from congregation. And that was our base, but actually, it was kind of intimidating start ch uh, chamber choir uh, because we didn't know who's gonna want to be in it. Yes. <laughs> right, and we wanted the, the premise of why Bob wanted to create a professional choir was that he wanted to restore the respect to a professional choir singing as he felt and I felt was kind of lost. Mm. We were talking about, let's say, BBC choir. They all prefer, it's their full-time job. Right. All they do is singing and they get paid for it in such a way that they could make a living. Right. In the United States, we only could think like Chanticleer, the six men, a company of singers who travel all the time could make a living. Mm -hmm. Other professional musicians always have to have it on the side and it almost nobody gets paid. The beautiful Atlanta Symphony Chorus, 200 singers, an incredible group. They all were volunteers. And so that was a premise besides the fact that Bob wants to do this incredible, vast uh, richness of music that not necessarily you could fit in a church service. So that's how it came about. But it was kind of like jumping in the cold water <laughs> at the beginning. And we so didn't when, know if it was gonna work or not. And obviously it has because 25 plus years later, the choir is still going stronger and has just won its first Grammy. Wow. How did that make you feel? <laughs> you, should, you should have watched this video. We were set up a program not to win. It's our first nomination and first trip to LA and we found ourselves am among these big stars' names, and we were so happy just to be there. Right. I remember we met, we met um, a musician who said, ah, well, I was nominated 14 times and I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Never won, but 14 times. And we thought, oh goodness, I'm so ha we're so happy to be there. And we're sitting there in a huge concert hall, with the stage mm -hmm. and sitting there and it's 86 categories and classical music is not in the beginning. We're sitting and right. clapping and having a great time listening to the speeches. Uh, I just found out shortly before that Bob wrote a speech because everybody who was nominated is supposed to write a speech. He wrote a speech in the morning. We um, left Houston for LA and I didn't know what he wrote about. <laughs> this was his acceptance speech. Acceptance, right? Yeah, because yeah. 
in case. Zero, zero, zero point one percent. If we suddenly, I mean, he needs to come up on the stage and not to blubber. So that's, <laughs> and we were, and when they said, you know, this moment, this, yeah, we set up not to win, just to be a part of the party. We were very happy. Suddenly, it's, they said, and the winner is, it is instead of naming the conductor the, as they did, they suddenly named Duraflea, the composer of the uh, recording. And we froze. And the Grammy goes to Duraflea. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't even get up. And then we went up. And if you've watched this video, you see like Mariana Simpson trying to keep up with this Bob running down the aisle. Down the aisle. <laughs> yeah. In my, my arms are up and my mouth is moving. And what I was saying, because I was shocked, I was saying, that's not possible. They don't give first comer a Grammy. That's not possible. That's not, it couldn't be happening. And all these things, and people, a lot of my friends asked me what, what I was saying. I was saying that was my state, state of shock. But Bob is very composed, man. He 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 came up and said his speech, and um, it was incredible, incredible. And he practiced his he Russian as well. To say in the end of in the end of the speech, he said in Russian. I love you, and I was talking to you. Speaking to me, yeah, he yes. thanked me for being his supporter. And when I heard this, I was dropping down from the shock, but I didn't, didn't go all the way down. <laughs> well, look, like, congratulations! Obviously, winning that Grammy is uh, a high point for the life of the Houston Chamber Choir and obviously for for Bob and for yourself. Did he make you, when he started the choir, did he make you audition for the Houston Chamber Choir? Ah, huh. I don't think so. <laughs> no, okay. He knew me as a singer. Right. And uh, he... He auditioned me, you know, a couple of times down the road when he auditioned everybody. We, now we have a tradition, uh, he has established the policy to re-audition singers every year. And I'm like any member supposed to do that and I re-audition and I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but back then he didn't and um, I was, we were, working on that together. We auditioned other singers together, copying, you know, music, uh, doing a lot of work that's supposed to be done to prepare for the rehearsal, put music stands and everything. We just mm -hmm. uh, did it all together. And um, I'm glad I was there to help. Now Pro the Houston Chamber Choir, as you said, the Chamber Choir is a professional choir but it's not a full-time occupation. So when you're not doing Houston Chamber Choir things, do you have a day job? Oh, I have many. <laughs> 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 yes, I, um, at first, at the beginning, I was uh, part of Houston Children's Chorus. There is a community children's choir in Houston. And I was hired as a vocal coach and assistant conductor. I was I worked there for five years and then I left. So probably a couple of months after that, Bob went to a Texas Music Educators Convention and I don't remember why I didn't go. But from there, he brought a um, job ad that, uh, Parker Elementary School is looking for a music teacher. And I um, went, I, I, don't, I didn't teach in classroom ever in my life. 
except for my, it was a school practice uh, when I was uh, in, in conservatory, but it was like probably two weeks or didn't remember anything, nor that this experience would help me here <laughs> in the States. But I really, really, I really, really wanted to, to get a music job because for many years, I was told that America, by Russians, not by Pope and not by Americans, by Russians, that America doesn't need another choir conductor. They have plenty. <laughs> and I, I was suggested to change my profession and I tried actually. I, was, I took two years um, of radiology technology school in, um, in a hospital in Atlanta and I was fully certified X-ray tech. Huh. Uh, and in Houston, I was looking for a job, but nobody hired me. It's such a providence. <laughs> nobody hired me. Although I did a good, I mean, I, I graduated from this school with, with honor even, but I'm mm -hmm. so glad because I really didn't like it. I just wanted to, I just wanted, I didn't want to sit there and being, you know, and Doing nothing. A, a stone on my husband's neck. <laughs> Rock. <laughs> anyway, so um, it was, I came to Parker brought my tape from Camerton from Russia. I didn't have uh, any uh, references except for, you know, my husband, which doesn't count because he's biased. <laughs> and they yeah. asked me to teach in classroom. They hired me um, on a part-time basis, hourly basis to check what I'm good at. And I, for the first couple of months, I was teaching classroom, I was three times a week and two other times I would go to a wonderful master teacher, Catherine Hausman in Duchenne Academy and just copying what she's doing and bringing it back to the classroom. <laughs> I survived these three months and then they allowed me to start the choir and then they hired me full time and that's a history 20 years ago. And you're still teaching at Parker Elementary. Oh, yes, I uh -huh. do. If, yeah, if you can call it teaching right now, but, but yes, well, I've been teaching there for 20 years. And how in that time has the choral program developed? Oh, uh, Parker is a, a wonderful place to be hired to, to and to work with, to work in. It's a magnet music school. I believe the music, magnet music school of such magnitude is the only one in Houston and I think in Texas and I think Parker is the best magnet music school in the whole United States. Yes. Maybe I'm bi biased. But, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, we have music uh, department with nine teachers, including me. We have violin, uh, three violin teachers, a cello teacher, two band directors, piano, guitar program, and we uh, serve about 700 children. And wow. all our classes are in, in a, on the schedule during the day. And we also have group classes. Uh, no, I always have group classes. It's a choir, but uh, for instance, instrument uh, instrumental instructors, they are having private lessons with kids. So it's really a remarkable program. But when I came, uh, there was no choir in there and I, I've created the program. It was 30, uh, anybody could sing in the beginning. And then now it's 250 students are in chorus from mm -hmm. grade one to grade five. So it's, uh, it's and it's very a remarkable uh, thing to do and it's possible. I'm the only one uh, with these 250 children. Uh, we don't even have an um, accompanist. We hire accompanists when we have performances. So what is the commitment of the students when they become a member of the choir? 
is this part of their regular curriculum or is this something that is outside of their regular curriculum? It is uh, the nature of the magnet school. It is, is that the music magnet school that some classes are held inside of curriculum. So mm -hmm. there is a class in public school. It's called ancillary class. So every, uh, every grade level has 45 minutes of ancillary. They go to PE, the, uh, to physical, physical education, computers, library, and music. And the schedule is set up such a way that a child every day go to a different uh, ancillary, and one of them is music. And so out of five days, one or two takes, by, uh, probably take, if child is in chorus and a string, so he, he's got two, two ancillary taken by music, and the rest of that goes to other subjects like PE, art, and whatever child chooses to do. So we have, uh, we see kids, depending on the level, we see them on a regular basis. Although first grade sees me only once a week, that, and second and third grade sees me twice a week, and uh, fourth, and first, fourth and fifth grade advanced chorus, I see them three times a week. That is one of the most important basis of how you could develop a great choir program, time. I have mm -hmm. time on my hands to teach them. And do they get to uh, perform concerts? Oh yes, mm -hmm. they leave for that. They love, they're so excited. We're performing concerts on a regular basis, we have uh, our winter concert, I mean, all the departments have. We have winter concerts, we have spring concert, uh, and we have uh, advanced chorus, the top performing groups, has a lot of concerts in town, out of town, and um, that has been a remarkable achievement of this particular program because can I brag a little bit? Uh, I, I think we can allow that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Parker Music Program won the Grammy Award back then when, a real Grammy Award, when, uh, back then when Grammy Recording Academy was giving music programs awards. They stopped that, unfortunately, several uh -huh. years ago, uh -huh. but they were alternating between elementary and high school. So with the year they offered that to elementary, we won. And the oh, next wow. year was high school and Houston uh, High School for the Performing and Visual Art won the Grammy. So that was a remarkable achievement that uh, Parker Chorus was already a part of. And then um, Parker Advanced Chorus was invited to perform for American Choral Directors Association Convention, the organization that is um, 61 years old. In these 61 years, the only elementary school that was invited three times, that was Parker. And um, it also has to say something about the state of elementary music education that I would like to touch. But I um, want to also mention that Parker uh, Chorus was uh, singing Mahler Third Symphony with uh, Houston Symphony a couple of years ago with um, um, Orozco Estrada, Andres Orozco Estrada conducting, and that was amazing thing for kids because oh, yes. some of them, believe it or not, never stepped into the, uh, the concert hall and their families especially. Mm -hmm. So that was an eye opener, not for just kids, but for their families and all of them loved it. So hopefully they still coming. <laughs> so let me ask you, what do you think 
the students take away from being part of a choir, from being part of a, a choral ensemble? You know, that's a very good question because over these 20 years, I've seen lives changed. I'm not speaking about chorus only. I'm speaking about music, music performing mm -hmm. groups in general. That, that what Parker is. It's a music performing groups. Parker is a Title I school. And we serving families of all kinds of backgrounds. Sometimes kids, the only f meal they have, it's meal in school. Oh, wow. The only mm -hmm. smile they have, it's smile of a teacher. And it's when they get a free music education, it's incredible. And so they get to sing. I'm gonna speak of the choir, but it relates to every, uh, our group. They get to sing in a group of friends. And they making music that, that touch people's hearts. It gives them tremendous power. They also give them a goal to strive. I'm very strict. They need to do their homework. They need to know their music. And they do it because they love it so much. And sometimes it's not easy, but they mm -hmm. do it. And they actually turn around their parents, their parents see what kind of a group it is and they help. They also become fans of music, and that's also very important for the society. Besides, if you look at the picture, a photograph of Parker Chorus, you will see you see United Nations there. You see uh, Biden, African Americans, and Latinos, and you see Asian, and and these kids, they they love each other. They work for one goal, they're friends. We sing a lot of folk songs from all over the world in different languages. They learn how to celebrate uh, people's differences because it's a celebration when people are so different and they all, in each of the nationality, each race could bring something from them. Kids' eyes just lit up when they sing Mexican song and spiritual and Russian. We have Russians in this community too. And Filipino, they just, they talk about that at home constantly. So that's a way to be friends. They're diff they fa their favorite song, we're singing it every year. Mm -hmm. It's the song by um, uh, Wallace Hornady. It's called Come and Sing. The words are, People who make music together cannot be enemies. And then it says, cannot be enemies at least while the music lasts. They, every year, they ask me if we could sing this song, and we do, because it's such an important message. Now, think about coming out to an adult life having these messages in you, we will not have this problem like we're having right now in, in our society. The racism will not happen if people just sing in a choir <laughs> or making music together. This is such a wonderful way. And, and so I really wish, maybe somebody's going to listen to me uh, when you air this broadcast, somebody from district, from Ministry of Education, that will maybe help uh, establish music in every school on the elementary level. Because a lot of mm. people, do, they don't take elementary level seriously, but yet this is the most important level to start because that's you having these kids who would go with you number of extra miles if they believe in what you're doing they were yes. so devoted so dedicated they they love it and they will have it for life 
So isn't that a wonderful, and all you teach them is how to love each other, how to be, respect each other, how to celebrate the differences. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a school of life, not just school. Besides, you could really teach them a higher um, choral art because uh, Park Elementary School just a few weeks ago won American Prize National Competition. And they compete with grown uh, in you it's a youth division but all mm -hmm. other choirs like first first place we are second place first place very our, our choir that kids were from grade nine to grade 12 and then oh. so it's a really a huge honor so elementary uh, level kids could sing three part, four part, they could sing musically, they could sing with heart. And it's, it's really on a, a top professional, top level as, as top of the, so anything. So I wanna give a message to uh, university college graduates. They, most of them think, dream about at least high school to go and conduct big pieces of music. SATB or middle school, but mm -hmm. no, but n not many of them want to go to elementary because they didn't think it's possible to make m real music. So I'm here to prove them wrong and tell them. And it's, it's the most important place to be. So please come. Well, <laughs> As if Parker Elementary were not enough for you, in 2006, you founded the Treble Choir of Houston. That's true. What is that and, and how is that different from what you do at Parker? Uh, first of all, my husband asked me to do that and I could say no to my husband. <laughs> Krasuch Cathedral is located in downtown Houston. It's a wonderful uh, congregation, but everybody who goes there lives outside of downtown. Mm -hmm. And for many, many, many years, we observed parishioners hesitate to bring their kid, drive miles extra in extra day to bring them to the children's choir rehearsal. So children's choir at the cathedral was really very, very small always. And so Bob once he asked me, he said, can you, do you think you can do, establish a children's choir program, even if the children are not uh, members, uh, their family are, families are not members of the Christchurch Cathedral? And I said, I'll try. Mm -hmm. So what I did, I asked, uh, Parker fifth graders who graduated from Parker and if they want to continue with me and many of them did mm -hmm. so uh, they basically followed me up and uh, we had rehearsal in downtown at the beginning it was also mixed choir like back many years in Russia and then um, I have a special spot for the girls and I, as I already mentioned, I really think even in, in the United States, which compared to Soviet Union where I lived is, you know, incredible step up in progress and freedom and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to really work hard and you have to sometimes fight to establish position of the of a woman in a society and i and from that notion that comes i don't know not on genetic level maybe of from a bringing from common knowledge um the girls come a lot of girls come with a very low self-esteem singing in a choir and singing well brings your self-esteem up yeah. you feel powerful because you see in front of your very eyes how the confidence 
is going up. How you touch people's heart, people cry after your performance or during or laugh and come and tell you what an incredible impact you made on them. And uh, to feel it over and over, it's incredible, powerful thing. And so uh, besides in the uh, girls choir, uh, I'm conducting, it's called Treble, Treble Choir of Houston. The girls come and we talk about life and sometimes they have nobody to listen to and we always listen. We always give them encouraging words. So it's a team, team of friends. And um, over the years, I have a lot of girls who graduated and become professional musicians or not, become artists, became, they, they, they become uh, a social worker and, and music therapist and all of them, we, again, like in Russia, we, we keep close connection and they come back to me saying what an important part Treble Choir was for them. Mm -hmm. in their lives and it makes me always feel that I was right when I was choosing this profession. But how many how many girls are in the choir and, and what are their age ranges? Um, the ranges uh, from sixth grade which is 11 years old to 18 mm -hmm. and you know last year two fifth grade is crept in <laughs> uh, there were family members sisters and I have one girl that lives in Houston he choose to keep singing in a uh, treble choir after school uh, but mostly is between 11 and 18. How many members are there of the uh, treble it's choir? About, it's from 35 to 40. Okay I know one of the special things that you get to do with the treble choir is occasionally you get to sing with the Houston Chamber Choir. Oh yes, that is such an incredible honor to us. Every year, treble choir is a guest. Um, it's featured at, Vil at the Villa de Mattel, uh, part of the uh, Christmas at the Villa, with Houston Chamber Choir. We sing our own section. And then we sing together in the grand finale song, which is amazing and, and exciting. And it's actually make, makes Christmas to every member of Chamber Choir and every member of their families. Mm -hmm. And uh, that actually, in another empowering thing for the girls to be on a part with such professionals and they, because they are singers for so many years, they hear very well what a caliber of the choir it is and they are proud. We sang a couple of other concerts with Chamber Choir. Um, uh, we sang St. Nicholas Cantata. We sang a Ceremony of Carols. Uh, the first um, Leonard Bernstein concert. And then just this, this year, this year is such an incredible high and low for us. Low because of COVID and high because of Grammy and because of collaboration with um, Bob Chilcott, who wrote a cantata for um, uh, chamber choir, um, percussion orchestra and children's choir. And so the girls to get to, got to, rehearse, perform, and make a recording with Bob Chilcott and Chamber Choir. It was grueling during the school week to come every night and stay late and got, got, got back to school in the morning. Mm -hmm. None of them complained. In fact, I remember after the first rehearsal uh, was chamber choir in South Main Baptist Church. We went out, we were dismissed. The girls were dismissed, they went out and I was giving them instructions for the next day. And one of them said, 
Miss Simpson, can I say something? And I said, sure, of course. And she said, girls, do you even realize how incredibly we all blessed singing next to chamber choir and singing such a beautiful music? I will never, ever forget it in my life. Mm. And, and that was really rewarding. So after the recording, I saw them like making a line to Bob Chilcott and he told me later, they said, thank you for changing my life. Mm -hmm. and, same th and same thing they said about singing with Jim McGuire. So this is incredible um, luck. I'm very grateful to be a part of this whole thing. What's that piece titled, the Bob Chilcott piece? Oh, it's called A Circle Song. Circle Song. Yes. It's, uh, he wrote a wonderful music on uh, indigenous people text. And it's 11 movements. And each movement has the words, the text that stays with you forever, you know, so many hundreds of years, but the value, the, the things that human uh, being cherish the most, the soul searching, what's right, what's wrong, what's inspiring, what's true to life, they are in a connection to the nature. They're still, still there, it's still true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's it's amazing experience really i think one of the most remarkable things about talking to you mariana is that you begin to realize that singing in a choir that choral experience obviously it's about music but in a broader sense it's about community isn't it yes it is yes it is it's, it makes me just wish that everybody understands that. Life will be so much easier in many ways. I even think that, that, that fights and wars and antagonistic um, interactions will diminish if everybody would do music, singing, any kind of music in community, together. They would understand each other and peace, no war. <laughs> One final question. Yes. Does Bob still drive that Miata? he wouldn't mind but he loves sports cars and all the cars he tried to get grown-up car but then he couldn't <laughs> stand it <laughs> so now here he um it was mazda uh, it uh mazda 367 something that low to the ground and makes a terrible noise I, uh, and then um now he drives infinity sports version so i like that about him he's threatened to to ride a motorcycle but i said <laughs> that said is no my dead body <laughs> <laughs> so, ariana it, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you thank you very much for uh, giving us your time and your experiences and your insights and thank you for all that you do to serve not just the houston chamber choir but the choral community in houston and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it and uh, honored to be here. Our pleasure. And thank you to all of the sponsors and patrons of the Houston Chamber Choir. And thank you to you for joining us. I'm Sinjin Flynn. This is Behind the Music. Please join us again next time. Thank you. The Houston Chamber Choir's With One Accord is your one-stop shop for choral joy. If you enjoyed this content, Help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. 
As a 501c3 nonprofit organization, support from listeners like you allows us to continue creating new and exciting content. For more information about us and how you can support our work, visit HoustonChamberChoir.org/give.